Cool. We're now live. All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's TCS Plus. My name is uh, Gautam Kamitz. I'll be your operator and moderator for today. Uh, behind the scenes, uh, we also have uh, helping us uh, Thomas Vidic, uh, Odette Regev, Ilya Rajenstein, Clement Kinnan, uh, and Anindya Day. And uh, so today, uh, we we're very lucky to have Richard Pang as our speaker. Before we continue, I'm going to go around the table and introduce our uh, groups. So first, joining us from IU, we have a group uh, led by Irfan. Uh, from Fudan University, we have uh, Juan Li. Uh, it must be a very odd time there. Thank you for joining us. From uh, Georgia Tech, we have uh, Saurabh joining us. Uh, Michigan has a group led by uh, Shanan. Hello. Thomas has uh, got a group uh, from Caltech. Uh, and I guess this is and Ben Lee, I see him there as well. Toronto has a group today. Hello. Uh, Yasemin has is here from uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, you is here. Uh, I'm not sure from which institution. I'm sorry. Uh, Yuan Yuan is also here from Georgia Tech. And uh, finally, we have uh, Yu Hao from RPI. That's all our groups today. Um, uh, I'd like to also mention, so coming up two weeks from now, we will have uh, Tasha Full Sarnak from TTIC. And uh, two weeks after that will be uh, Chris Pikert. So we have a lot of uh, exciting talks to, uh, coming up very soon. So without further ado, allow me to introduce our speaker, Richard Peng. Uh, Richard Pang is currently a assistant professor at uh, the Georgia Institute of Technology and currently a visiting researcher at Microsoft Research Redmond. Um, he's received a number of awards, including the NSF Career Award, Microsoft Research PhD Fellowship, and uh, the CMU Distinguished Dissertation Award. And he's done a lot of very excellent work on uh, graph algorithms, uh, and he's going to tell us about some of it today. So without further ado, uh, please take us away, Richard. Okay, uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. That's all good? Okay. Uh, thank you, Gautam, for the introduction. Uh, and also thanks uh, to the organizers, especially Ilya and Aninde, for, uh, for telling me about this and uh, for getting me to uh, give a talk. Uh, so, the, so I'll be talking about uh, graph data structures, specifically fully dynamic spectral vertex sparsifiers and their applications. Uh, this result uh, is joined uh, with uh, uh, three great co-authors, uh, David Durfee, who was a grad student at Georgia Tech working with me and is now at LinkedIn, uh, Yu Gao, who is actually on this uh, call and uh, who is a grad student working with me at Georgia Tech, and also Gramos Goranchi, who, uh, who was a visitor uh, last spring and uh, is just finishing up his PhD at the University of Vienna. Uh, they're all great. Uh, I think some of you in the Hangout know know some of them. I highly encourage you to talk with them about this as well, because they have fairly different takes on this as well. And uh, basically, this result would not look this way had, uh, ha had I not had a chance to talk with them. So uh, without further ado, I'll start talking about uh, the, uh, the, uh, the result. So this project uh, is very much motivated by uh, large graphs and networks. So large graphs is a very odd form of big data in that uh, they are large, in that uh, you can't get away with, say, quadratic time algorithms on them. But at the same time, they also fit in memory. So there's a very odd form of uh, large-scale processing, which is my entire data fits in memory, or, or it fits on my disk, and, uh, I'm, and I need to improve the performance of my algorithms. And this is a space where there has been a lot of uh, tools recently. So there has been GraphKai is one of the first ones that, that uh, uh, took a lot of the primitives and said, hey, I'm a single processor. I can run them really fast. By now, there are, are a lot of these uh, large-scale graph analytic pl platforms. Two other ones I'm familiar with. One is Stinger, because it's from Georgia Tech. And uh, the other one is NetworkKit, which uh, also has some of these more numerical uh, aspects. <clears throat> 
So a lot of these uh, uh, high performance graph analytics primitives, what they rely on is they rely on the fact that graphs are actually gradually changing. So examples of dynamically changing graphs are the traffic network uh, as of this morning, actually. So it's, the reds are the places where they're highly congested, and this will change as the day, hour of the day goes on. Uh, a social network, you have uh, friends being added, friends being deleted. And then a more extreme example is just power failures in a power grid or, or, or router failures in a network. So you have this phenomenon that you have a large but very slowly changing data set. And it fits in memory. So this leads to the notion of dynamic graph algorithms or dynamic graph data structures, where the idea is I want to be able to efficiently handle updates as well as querying some kind of information using either small space or small time. So I so the notion of small space is semi-streaming, uh, is semi-streaming uh, or streaming or semi-streaming algorithms. But the one that I will focus on for this talk is time. So the notion of I want to just maintain updates under a small amount of update time. And that is the main focus of this talk. So dynamic graph data structures are among some of the most well-studied topics in graph data structures. So two of the uh, ones that have seen the most, uh, most work are connectivity as well as shortest path. Uh, that doesn't, but, but uh, uh, so these are the ones where there has been a lot of recent work, and I'm almost certainly missing a lot of references. So if you if you have your favorite reference and it's not mentioned here, please just type it into chat, and I'll try to add it add it afterwards. Probably by, probably by switching to a smaller font. To even worsen the lack of references, uh, there's also the fact that dynamic graph data structure have actually been studied in a lot of other settings. So anything related to trees and path, you can also study. In fact, anything that makes sense in a static setting, it, it makes sense to be studied in a dynamic set. So this includes the precursor of connectivity where people were looking at dynamic trees, the so trees where you insert, remove edges. And this also includes the kind of the, uh, the applications of connectivity and shortest path, which are things like minimum cut as well as matchings and also max flow on dynamic graphs. So the only thing that's worse than missing references is to try to summarize references I don't fully know about. But I'll make an attempt anyways. And this is the first point where if you have any questions, comments, about or think I'm being too vague, just ask me questions. And hopefully, I'll try to notice it in time to answer them. So my general understanding of the state of dynamic graph data structures is that uh, what, what we understand really well are quantities related to a single path. So these are things like dynamic trees, where there's a unique path between a pair of vertices, as well as small connectivity. So small connectivity are like things like one or two connectivity, where your underlying skeleton of your problem is still a tree-like object. The, the other kind of uh, one path object that we understand very well by now is single source shortest path. So this is, I have, a, I have a graph where the edges are gradually being removed and I just wanna maintain the shortest path tree from a single source to everyone. On the other hand, I claim that what we have a lot of trouble with in dynamic graph data structures is the situation where there's multiple path. Here, here, the answer is not all negative in that there has been a lot of really great work on maintaining a global minimum cut. So this is the fewest edges that needs to be removed to disconnect the graph. But on the other hand, for, for the much wider classes of problems that are possible with multiple path, uh, the, the general picture is much more murky in that for all pair shortest path, things like all pair shortest path, max flow, clustering, we either know results only in fairly limited settings, such as you're only inserting edges, or with fairly large approximation factors, or in general, we just don't know much. So one way to think about this project at a high level is that we are trying to address this issue of can we develop new dynamic graph data structure primitives that are more friendly to this kind of multiple path questions on dynamically changing graphs. And the problem we study is actually of uh, 
is a bit of a, a non com it, it's a non combinatorial problem, which is actually we go and and maintain these spectral graph primitives in sublinear time. But the main result of this paper is that we show that a lot of these spectral graph algorithm primitives can be maintained in sublinear time on general graphs. So to, as a quick introduction to spectral algorithms, one way to think about it, the word spectral, it actually means ghostly in that there is some, some other underlying quantity that's governing the behavior of algorithm. In this case, it's the, uh, it's the spectrum of the graph or its list of eigenvalues. Uh, eigenvalues of a graph is a little bit of a mysterious concept, but probably you have all heard about uh, the Fourier spectrum, which, I mean, this is what happens if you... So the picture on the left is what happens before you transform a cat. But in general, what's going on is that there are these kind of underlying uh, numerical quantities that's really governing the algorithm. But on the other hand, I claim that a lot of these primitives uh, also correspond very naturally to objects that we do care about in large graphs and networks. And I'll get to that in a second. But for now, you can think about the, qu the key quantities we're maintaining are things like the commute time of a random walk, which is if you random walk on a graph, the expected time to go from vertex A to vertex B and then come back. You can also think about it, these things as maintaining the voltage of electrical flows. So this is if you, put, if you take a graph, you hook it into the wall, you can actually maintain the, uh, the, the voltages at all the vertices as this graph is being updated. Both of these primitives are key numerical primitives in graph theory as well as combinatorial optimization. And I'll get to that connection in a second as well. But for now, you can just think about it as these are reasonably important primitives in current static graph algorithms. And, the, and, the, and what I find more interesting about what we did is the tools we use. So to my knowledge, this is one of the first results on general graphs that's based on vertex sparse algorithms. So the key algorithmic idea in this result is that we try to shrink the graph into a set of terminal vertices. So in this picture on the left, you have this T, which is our use to denote the set of terminal vertices. And what happens is we take our general graph and we shrink it onto this subset of terminals. And then we just do all the computation on this subset of terminals. And this subset has sublinear size. And then what we boil the problem down to is picking a good set of terminals, as well as a lot of random sampling. So underneath all of this, there's several layers of random sampling that's needed to downsample a graph onto a subset of the terminals. And that's the main result as well as structure of the, of the technical parts. Any questions at this point? Okay, so for the so for the for the rest of this talk, the plan is I will first go into a discussion of what are spectral graph algorithms. Then I'll introduce the notions of spec sparsification and coarsening, which are the kind of the key primitives that uh, this result builds upon. And then I'll discuss the notion of terminals and random walks as well, and as well as finish with summaries and extensions. So let me first start off by describing the key primitive that we're maintaining, which is effective resistance. So this notion of REFF UV, what this is, is the expected time for a random walk to go from U to V back to U divided by M. But that's not the fun way to think about effective resistance. The fun way to think about effective resistance is that you've just electrocuted your graph. So what you do is you build a model of your graph and then you plug S into one end of a socket and then you plug or into a wall socket and you plug T into the other end. And what this effective resistance is actually measuring is actually taking a voltmeter and measuring the voltage needed to send one unit of current from U to V. So this is a quantity that uh, has a variety of uh, natural connections to things like random walks, electricity. But for the more combinatorially oriented, the way you can think about effective resistance is that it's a quantity that is small, both when either the source is close to the sink, as well as if there are many paths from source to sink. So the analogy you can draw here is from your, from basically the series and parallel notion of effective resistance. So if you have hook resistors in series, resistance increases. 
But if you have resistances in parallel, if you have multiple paths in parallel, the resistance will decrease. So the picture, so the, the two on the two examples below, these are actually examples where the resistance from the source and sink, which are connected by the red edges, these are the same. These actually have the same resistance. In both cases, the resistance is about 0.66. So resistance is one of these notions that just that measures not just how far the source and sink are apart from each other, but also how many paths there are. And it's kind of an average between those two quantities. So in some sense, for a lot of these network science applications, I would actually claim that resistance is actually a better measure than, say, just straight up distance or just straight up max flow, which is how much, how many paths are there. It is a quantity that's, that's somewhere intermediate between this. So that's kind of like appealing to your uh, electrical engineering intuition for what is, what is a resistance on a graph. Next, let me apply, uh, appeal to your machine learning intuition. In that the way you can, the other way you can think about effective resistance is that you, you're trying to pull, label the vertices of a graph. So this maximize over X. And you want to move S and T as, as far apart as possible. But then what you want to do is you want to, you want to penalize the edges for how far they're being stretched. So this trailing term in the summation, so that on the right of the summation, this trailing term, what that is, is summing over all u connected to v of the difference of the label squared, so x u minus x v squared. So effective resistance, the other, so this is actually a bit of a semi-supervised learning problem in that you're trying to move the two vertices as far apart as possible while minimizing the sum of squares, so the, so the sum of squares of the difference of labels on the edges. Somewhat surprisingly, this is actually a notion that has very close connections with combinatorics in that it's actually possible to draw this sum of squares. So there is this actually famous problem in combinatorics called uh, squaring the square, which by now that it's actually on the memorial plaque of, the, of William Tutt, who was one of the, one of the founders of uh, algebraic slash spectral graph theory. And the other natural interpretation is that actually it's the, the energy the minimum sum of squares of a flow from S to T. So here the idea is, so just like you have network flows, you can also do what's called electrical flows, which is that um, every, I'm trying to just still route one unit from the source to a sink of a graph. And I'm minimizing the sum of squares of the edges. So as you might imagine, this is, these two formulations, one has very cl close connections to graph labeling or cuts. And the other has very cl close connections to network flows. And in fact, there are algorithmic ways to formalize this connection and use these spectral primitives uh, as, as inner loops or as kind of the algorithmic backbones of max flow and transshipment algorithms. In fact, my favorite way of doing this uh, is to just take the two, cross it out, and put in a general norm. So, you, so there are algorithms now that just remove the two and just putting a general p-norm and runs in roughly the same time as a static effective resistance algorithm. But that is a whole nother uh, talk. And uh, uh, I highly encourage you to look at the, some of the pointers in the citations of the slide. But uh, that's really for a different talk. So to ground things, a so let me, before I move on, let me ground things a little further in that I want to give the algebraic formulation of what is effective resistance. So in fact, effective resistance is closely related to one of the most central objects in algebraic and spectral graph theory, which is the graph Laplacian matrix. So you can form a, you can turn a graph into a matrix by putting the degrees on a diagonal. And then for every edge that exists, you can put it at its corresponding two vertices, but in the off diagonal entry. So the idea is that my vertices of my graph maps to columns and rows of, of my matrix, and my edges maps to my non-zeros. So the part of the reason we picked effective resistance to study is that there has been a lot of data structure work on maintaining matrices. And we figured that both the matrix and the graph theoretic connections are very useful for getting a type of a vertex sparsification type data structure started. <clears throat> 
Uh, just as a little bit of a further aside, this graph Laplacian matrix actually has a whole whole bunch of use in graph algorithms. And this has been collectively referred to as the Laplacian paradigm for designing graph algorithms. You can use it to embed graphs. You can use it to do spectral clustering. And you can also use it to solve optimization problems on graphs. And what's, what's even more exciting there is that now there are actually several code packages. So there, in the last 10 years, there has, has been several code packages released. So the lean algebraic multigrid, combinatorial multigrid, and most recently, the, the Laplacian.jl package. And these are able to handle Laplacian linear systems with about, say, 10 million edges in about 20 seconds, which is about the getting to the size of your large image network, social network, that type of size. So this, a lot of this actually, at least in the static setting, they correspond very closely to code packages by now. And going back to effective resistances, what effective resistance is, is the indicator factor from S to T, but measured in the norm that is the inverse quadratic form of the graph Laplacian matrix. So in some sense, it is a very natural formula that one could write using this graph Laplacian matrix. It's just the distance from S to T in the norm given by the resistance norm. So I and, this, and by the way, effective resistance does form a norm. It also forms a metric. It uh, has a whole bunch of nice properties there as well. So formally, the main result I will talk about is that we give algorithms that maintain fully dynamic graphs one plus epsilon approximation to effective resistance in about m to the 4 thirds, so m to the 0 0.75 time, when the graph is unweighted. And we also get a runtime that is about n to the 5 over 6, so n to the 0.83 per update or query on weighted graphs. And by fully dynamic, I mean that there are edges being inserted, there are edges being deleted, and the queries can happen at any point. We also maintain, for the more general purpose use of Laplacians, we also give a, a, a solution to just Lx equal to b, but measured in some notion of epsilon approximation in time that is roughly m to the 11 over 12 polylog and poly epsilon. But the later result is just for only for unweighted bounded degree graphs. And I don't think any of these exponents are the right numbers. And also that uh, the, the model that we work on is non-adaptive adversary. So this is a very important distinction in that we, we use a lot of randomized primitives. So we don't, uh, we're not able to handle updates or queries that depend on the internal randomness of the data structure. So in some sense, our result is a dynamic algorithm, but it's not, a fully, it's, it's not as powerful as the most powerful data structure you would want in that we cannot handle updates and queries that depend on the output of the previous query. And also for the purpose of, purpose of this talk, I will only talk about the, the effective resistance results and I'll pretend epsilon is a constant. Any questions at this point? Okay, so now I have uh, introduced the problem. I will start talking about the tools and uh, I'll talk about how to put the I'll start talking about introducing the tools that one can use to address this kind of dynamic problems. And the first things to mention are the notion of sparsification. So the notion of sparsification is that I want to I have a dense graph, for example, a random, a very dense random graph. And I want to remove edges while preserving something. So this is a notion that has been very well studied in combinatorics, and there the the first form of this is really random graphs in that there's a lot of result that says a, a random graph approximates a complete graph. But what's, what's often not omitted when we talk about sparsification is that the study of graph sparsification has always been very closely connected with the study of dynamic graph data structures. In that actually the first results for dynamic graph sparsification is motivated by dynamic minimal spanning tree as well as dynamic three connectivity. So this is going back to what I was saying earlier about low connectivity in that in these settings, it's, in these settings, one of, the, one of the approaches for designing better data structures is just to sparsify the graph. Uh, more recently in, uh, in kind of a precursor to this, this result, uh, so joined with uh, Itai Abraham, David Durfee, Sebastian Kieringer, now Foster, uh, Yanis Kudis, uh, we gave dyna dynamic versions of cut sparsification as well as spectral sparsification. So, so the 
so before this result, it's known that almost any graph, almost any dynamic graph can be, you can, for any dynamic graph, you can maintain a sparse approximation that preserves all cuts or linear operator in time that is roughly polylog per update. So if you plug that result into this dynamic resistance type result, what you immediately get is you're able to turn the M into an N. So, so immediately you can turn the, uh, the factor of M. So instead of having order M per update, you can immediately get to about order M poly log M per operation by just maintaining a sparsifier and then only updating the sparsifier. So the Sorry, Richard, was, uh, did this holds for uh, which type of uh, problems, like for all problems or effective resistances or what? Uh, anything that's cut or spectral based. So this does not hold for shortest path. For shortest path, you don't. We actually don't know very good sparsifiers. I think, in, in fact, for shortest path, there are fairly strong counterexamples against it. Uh, but for for the graph cuts, so graph cuts. If you preserve graph cuts, what you preserve is you preserve the value of max flow. If you preserve the graph operator, what you preserve is you preserve the value of. Uh, of uh, effective resistance, you also preserve linear system solutions. So in these settings, because we have a, yes, so it basically preserves anything that uh, you have a sparsifier for. But yes, I, I agree with you that the notion of graph sparsification is a little bit funny in that instead of saying that, hey, here's a way to sparsify, here's a way I want to downsample my graph. And once I downsampled my graph, I try to pr prove it preserve something. Sparsification in some sense turns the question around in that it says, hey, I want to preserve something. Now give me a way to downsample my graph so that I'm still happy. And the, the general way that you build a sparsifier is that you just try to identify edges you, don't, you can't afford to throw away. So for example, if you, have a, if you look at connectivity, you don't want to throw away any bridges. But for a lot of the edges, that's not bridges. In fact, for edges that you can certify their log and destroying path from its two endpoints, you can afford to throw those away. And that's essentially how, how these dynamic sparsifiers work. Is they, they're just a way to dynamically go identify the edges that are not very important in your graph and then random sample on. So then the question, so this is basically the edge reduction scheme. But remember our goal is to get to sublinear in the number of vertices. So we actually need also a vertex reduction scheme. So the, the kind of the key in this result is the ability to eliminate vertices. And when we speak of eliminating vertices, there is a very natural scheme that you would want to use to eliminate vertices, which is Gaussian elimination. So there's something very interesting when it comes to graph Laplacians and Gaussian elimination. In that Gaussian elimination actually preserves exactly the resistances between the vertices that remain. So that what this leads to is leads to the notion of the sure complement matrix, which is I just take, I pick a subset of vertices for a subset of vertices that known as, which I will refer to as a terminal vertices. I go run Gaussian elimination on everything that's not a terminal vertex. There's a whole bunch of level of detail. So row reducing a matrix and so on, but the short answer is that the, the short way to think about this is that Gaussian elimination, in fact, exactly preserves the inverse on the remaining vertices. So the way, the, the way you can actually think about Gaussian elimination is you take the inverse of the matrix, you take just the part that you care about, and you invert that back. And you can prove that because the resistance is just a quadratic form in this inverse, you can, you can show that the effective resistance is preserved under eliminating any subset of vertices. And what is actually amazing here is that this matrix is still a graph. And in fact, this phenomenon actually has been studied in network science separately as the notion of coarsening a graph. And here and below is actually an illustration of what happens if you try to coarsen a graph to a smaller subset of vertices. So in, in some sense, effective resistance was a very effective resistance was a very natural property to study in that there it directly corresponds to a vertex elimination routine. 
And this vertex elimination routine has a variety of very natural interpretations, even in the graph theoretic set. In fact, my favorite interpretation of what this vertex elimination routine does is that it's the expected behavior of doing the following to the edges that's outside of the set of vertices, outside the terminal vertices. So the way that you can think about a short complement is that it's the expected behavior of the following. So it's the long-term expectation of taking every edge of my graph, taking both of its endpoints, and just random walking them until both of them are in the terminal vertices. So it's the expected behavior of taking the vertices and just pulling them by random walk until they are in the terminal set. Questions about these definitions? Okay, so now I have to, once again, I have to say a little bit of what, what algebraically it represents. And this algebraic formula is also very, it's also fairly useful for understanding what, what the way we're gonna use this object. In that what it does is that you take the graph Laplace matrix and you partition it into the terminal vertices and the non-terminal vertices. So here in the picture on the left, the non-terminals are on the top left of this matrix. And then what you apply to this matrix is the following formula which is you take the bottom right block, which is the block you want to have remaining, and you subtract from it a quadratic form involving an uh, outer product of, well, you just put the, the pieces in a way that the dimensions match. And then you have an inverse of the top left block. This one requires a little better understanding of the properties of a graph Laplacian to relate to the random walk definition. But one way to think about it is that like the top left block, so the block in the middle, this L V, v minus T v, v minus T inverse, that is actually a probability transition matrix. But the key properties that this formula gives is that A, this composes really well with approximations. So sure, complements are very well preserved under approximations. And B, that it decomposes nicely. So the key thing to notice is that it, the part in LTT, so the part in the remaining terminals, this is just added. So you get this following formula, which is that if I add something onto the, my terminal set, the sure complement of that is equal to the sure complement of the original graph with these edges added. So basically, whatever happens on the terminal set of vertices, that just happens separately to how the non-terminal edges gets eliminated onto my terminal vertices. Or in other words, this thing is very additive. And that is a very important property in data structures, is what you want in data structures is you want decomposability. You want to have some notion that your graph can be decomposed into two graphs, such as solving a problem on one graph and solving a problem on the other graph. You have some way of putting the answers back together. And this subtraction of the two terms, this in some sense is what's giving us the decomposability of our problem. So in particular, you can try, this leads to the following scheme of turning a vertex sparsifier into a data structure, which is that we only ever handle the updates and queries within our terminal vertices. So in particular, if we have an operation involving vertices U and V, what we do is we just add U and V to the set of terminal vertices. And then we just answer the operation. So we either do the update or the query on this vertex sparsifier. So what's, what's happening is the vertex sparsifier just gives us a smaller graph that we perform every update and query in. So the data structure, it tracks a small set of terminal vertices. Then it tracks a graph that approximates the sure complement. And then it tracks a sparsification of it, just so that once we have a vertex reduction, we immediately go get the edge reduction as well. So, and so this, so what the problem now boils down to is boils down to maintaining a set of terminals, as well as maintaining this sure complement on this set of terminals. Any questions at this point? Okay, so just to quickly recap, because I just introduced a lot of new definitions, which so that our goal for so our goal 
originally was to maintain effective resistance or some kind of numerical quantity between uh, while being able to handle queries for any pair of vertices. And what we have boiled the problem down to is that we want to maintain a set of terminal vertices as well as a sparsification of the sure complement onto the set of vertices. So that first of all, the set of vertices is small. So the number of terminal vertices is, is, is sublinear in the number of edges at least. Well, eventually we want to be sublinear in the number of vertices as well. And then we also want to maintain a, sparsi a sparsified version of this graph. And the way that we're gonna use this sparsification, this vertex sparsifier is that we're going to answer every query on this sparse graph on this subset of terminal vertices. And our the, the bulk of the work in this data structure becomes we want to propagate changes in G to changes in these random walks. And the way that the high level way we're gonna address this is that we're gonna set T to be sublinear in the number of vertices. So we're gonna set T. In fact, for the algorithm that I will pre present next, the choice of T we're gonna use is M to the 0 0.75. So for those that, so, you, so for the more observant, you can see that this is where the M to the 4 thirds is coming from. It comes from answer, answering every query on this sparse graph of the terminals. And the main technical issue that we, we end up addressing in this paper is that we want to address the, we want to set, set this up in a way so that any change in G leads to a very small amount of change in these random walks. So remember that edge sparsification, we have a data structure already, which means that any change in the initial representation of this sparse of this vertex sparsifier, it just leads to a certain number of updates in the edge sparsifier. So that makes all the updates free there. But then the key thing to do is to propagate changes in G to changes in the short complement. So we will, we will try to limit the amortized footprint of any updating G onto this vertex sparsifier to about M to the 0 0.75 as well. And, this, and, act, and actually, it is the trade-off between these two parameters. So the bigger the T is, the smaller the footprint. But the more expensive it, it becomes to update on this terminal graph. It is this trade-off that leads to this M to the 0 0.75 type of running time. Questions about this picture? So the, the first uh, observation that we use to try to limit this footprint is based on this random walk-based interpretation. So the way you can think about the short complement is that it's the expected behavior of, for each edge in the graph, random walk both of its endpoints until they're, they're in, in the terminal vertex set. This random interpretation turns out to be also very friendly to random sampling. So this was first used uh, in uh, Gaussian elimination-based uh, Laplacian solvers. This is joined with uh, Rasmus King, uh, Intad Lee, uh, Sushant Sachdeva, and uh, Dan Spielman. But as as with all these uh, all these right ways to think about the world, it's all it's it's first observed by Michael Cohen. And uh, the general idea here is that you sample log and random walks. And this is enough to give you a good enough approximation to the short complement. So the idea is all you have to do is to take every edge of the graph, take both of its endpoints, and random walk them until they're in T. And to, to, to maintain our approximation of the short complement, all we have to do is for all non-terminal edges, so for all edges with some endpoints outside the terminal, you random walk its endpoints until it's in T. So the process that we were gonna use to form, to form this good approximation of the short complement is that we first random walk every edge in G until they're in T. And that gives us a very dense graph. But then we have this edge sparsification routine for free. So we, then we can go sparsify that routine until it, we get the sublinear size object that corresponds to our uh, vertex sparsifier. 
And the second step by, by what I've been hiding under the rug this whole time is that the second step is essentially free up to poly log and poly one over epsilon factors. So the, the technical version of what we need for edges in G, so updates in G to have small footprint in updating the set of terminals, is that we, what we want is we, we want to have a, we want to have, we want to pick T so that every edge change in G has small effect in the graph that is random walking G onto the set of terminals. So in other words, an immediate goal is to choose T so that the random walk hits T in a sublinear number of steps. So the, so the, so the kind of the key question that this uh, data structure boiled down to is given a graph, how do I pick a subset of vertices so that each random walk is guaranteed to quickly reach T? And this thing sometimes is necessary in that if I have an edge whose random walk is really long, if I delete or if I update some edge that's on the walk, I need to go regenerate that entire walk. It's a little bit not obvious that this is sufficient, but you can prove that the, the load of random walks also don't blow up in that all you really have to do is, like the expected load is some quantity that depends on the length of these walks on edges. So if all the random walks are short, you can just go regenerate every walk that's affected by updates. So the goal is now just, given a graph, I want to pick a subset of the vertices so that every random walk quickly reaches that subset of vertices. And then this is the point where you take out the TCS hammer and you do, you do something terrible. So the first thing we tried is we just tried to do expander decomposition. For those not familiar with expander decompositions, these are objects that basically partition a graph into pieces where the random walk behaves very fast. And that turns out to be sufficient to get something. It, it was sufficient to get slightly sublinear for a sub, you can get to slightly sublinear length for T that is, that is slightly sublinear in the number of, of uh, edges. But that's clearly not the right way to do this. And in general, there's this pattern that for anything that you can do with expander decomposition, you can do with random sampling with some bias. And turned out this, what worked out far better, at least on unweighted graph, is the following scheme, which is I just take T to be the endpoint of beta M random edges. So I just literally go and pick M to the 0 0.75 random edges, and I assign all their endpoints to T. And what you get, you can prove there is that you can prove that if I just pick random edges, you, you can prove that the expected length of these walks is, is roughly beta negative two. Just as a quick sanity check why this is the right idea. For anything that we're doing, for any kind of divide and conquer on a graph, it must work on a path as well, right? Because a path is, it must work on a path. And a path, in some sense, is the most fundamental object we, do, we perform data structures to. So, so binary search tree and so on. This is all based on cutting apart a path. What happens if you take a path and you take the endpoints of beta m random edges? In expectation, you can show that the expected length. So what I, they, in the picture below, I took an example of a fairly short path and I simulated what happens if you just pick three random vertices, which are the ones that's highlighted. And what you can roughly prove is that the average gap between pairs of vertices is roughly one over beta. And now think about a random walk. If I take a k-step random walk, it's gonna, how much is gonna wobble left and right is roughly about square root of k. So you can prove that a random walk, when you have, a, when you have this kind of natural divide and conquer on a path, or you take a, this natural set of a portal or terminal vertices on path. What you can get is that in expectation that you take roughly the, the gap squared distance until you reach one of these terminal vertices. And this is how the beta and negative two roughly comes from. And turns out that this is provable on general graphs. And here the result we use is result by Barnes and Feige from 96 combinatorica. And what they prove is that on a unit weight graph, 
you can they prove the analogous result, which is that if I take a k-step random walk on a unit-weighted graph, in k steps, it's going to encounter roughly square root k different edges with high probability. So what they, what they prove is that most random walks on graphs hits a lot of vertices. And the way that you can do this analysis is that with any probabilistic process, you can kind of flip them backwards. So the, the way that the, the result we want is we want to say that if you generate random, if you pick the set of terminals, most of the random walks are good. What you can do instead is you can say, I pick a random walk. I pick a typical random walk. So that is one that has roughly 1 over beta vertices. And then I pick t. And so there you can prove that by do doing this flipping of probability, that you can prove that once I have beta m different vertices, well, a 1 over beta distinct vertices, then this choice of t is expected to hit a lot of them. So you first analyze the version where you generate, uh, then you, gener you generate the walks first, and then you generate t. And then you flip this around to the, to the same probability, which is what happens if you generate t first, and then generate the walks. And you can show that with high probability, almost every walk hits t in a small number of steps. In general, this type of technique is known as backwards analysis. And this, is, this has a whole bunch of very nice applications in graph algorithms as well as uh, uh, computational geometry. Questions about this proof? OK, so now we have the, the, the key technical result, which is that if I pick t to be a random subset of n points of edges, I can get a small query cost as well as small initialization cost. Because for initialization, all I do now is I just, for every edge of the graph, I just random walk them around. And then the overall data structure is more or less a static rebuild type of data structure. In that all I try to do now is I handle every update and query by adding the endpoints to t. So I basically go reinitialize t after every beta m steps. So, and so this is the goal here is I just want to prevent the size of t from getting too big. And then what happens is that the initialization cost, so, so basically the data structure, all it does is now it just goes, as it just adds everything to the terminals. And as soon as it get, the terminals gets too big, it goes and reinitializes everything. So the amortized cost of this initialization is just the initialization cost divided by the number of updates, which is beta negative 2 times m divided by beta m, which comes out to beta negative 3. And so, you, so now you optimize the query cost, which is beta m, against beta negative 3, which gets optimized about beta equal to m to the negative uh, 0 0.25. And then you get this amortized cost of uh, m to the 0 0.75 this way. Uh, for a weighted, so just as a side, this only works on unweighted graphs. Unweighted graphs, you can have random walks that get stuck. But there, the way to get around this issue is that you explicitly go simulate the random walks. So you generate the first one over beta different edges in each walk. And then you prove that that is, is, is expected to hit t fairly quickly. Uh, that uh, the algorithmic and the, the difference in cost there is actually turns out to be much more expensive to generate the first certain number of distinct edges than to simulate the walk for a first some number of steps. But to, to come back to things, the overall data structure is now essentially I initialize t with s some random number of, of uh, endpoints. And then I random walk every edge onto the endpoints. And the, and the funny thing about this data structure is that the update and query has roughly the same pseudocode. In that, if, in that all I do is I add both of them to the set of terminals, and I update or query on the approximation of the short complement. So the only real dynamic part of this data structure is this add terminal operation, which is I just add this vertex to the terminals. And then for any walk that hits, so now u is a terminal vertex which means that for any random walk that went past u, I just stop them at u, and I recompute the reweighting of the, of the walks. 
So all I do is when I add a vertex to the set of terminals, I include this vertex, and I update my graph sparsifier with these new set of walks. And that is essentially the entirety of the data structure. Questions? So now I'll, now I'll move on to uh, trying to summarize and what I think are what, what I think is going on in the bigger picture and discuss some potential for extensions. So I claim this result is fundamentally a fairly different approach to doing dynamic graph data structures. In that, data structures in a nutshell. So the picture on the left is uh, is a illustration of self-adjusting search trees. So this is way, one way to think about a binary search tree is that at the core of every data structure, there is a smaller set of index that allows you to selectively search and update on part of your data set. So, so in this example below, so the, for the most commonly discussed example is just a list of numbers. And what B-trees and this type of data, what B-tree type data structures try to do is they try to extract out a smaller set of numbers that more or less represent the entirety of your, of, of your set. And this is the same with dynamic graph data structures in that underneath every dynamic graph data structure, there is one of these search trees. And one of these search trees, they, they're building this index. So in general, one of the reasons that we are so good at indexing trees as well as planar graphs, or we're so good at designing dynamic graph data structures for trees and planar graphs is that they have good separators. In the trees and planar graphs, these just happen to be the objects where you can pick a subset of vertices in that most in, a lot of interesting things have to interact with this subset. And the issue with taking this type of approach to general graphs is it there for a lot of the interesting classes of graphs, such as random erdos rainy graphs, these are ones that provably don't have good separators. So you cannot take apart a general graph in the way that you can take apart a list of numbers or you can take apart a tree. In fact, even the solutions themselves, so things like flows and cuts, they're not always representable as trees. In that the flow structure, it's, it's a sequence of say four or five paths. That itself already does not have a tree-like representation. And in general, when you get to a highly dense instance, this only gets worse. So I claim at a very high level, what our approach is doing is that it's building this index from the aggregation of local information. So instead of trying to partition a graph from a in a top-down sense using graph separators, it's doing this very local coalescing until you naturally get to a small set of terminals. So, and, the, and essentially, it replaces a lot of the pathfinding and graph partitioning in, that's almost necessary in a lot of the earlier data structures in favor of elimination and sparsification. So if you're familiar with parallel algorithms, the other way to think about this is that instead of a top-down approach, this is actually a bottom-up approach to graph algorithms. And there is actually here, there's a much bigger picture here, which is that can we just build elimination-based graph algorithms? And in some sense, you can view this result as saying that anytime there is an elimination graph algorithm, it is much more amenable to some kind of parallelization as well as dynamic maintenance. And in fact, we actually know a lot of other settings where there are good vertex sparsifiers and uh, that for, for the purpose of data structures. Uh, for things like all pair min cut, this is the problem that has been studied the most. So for vertex sparsifiers for multi-commodity flow, there the answer is a slightly negative in that there one would need polylog factors. But turns, but what's also what's a little surprising here is that actually a surprising amount of positive answers if you start looking at the existing picture of combinatorial graph algorithms through this picture. So there's this result by Asadi, Kanan, Lee, and Tannen from a few years ago that says that for any value of C, so for any connectivity value, there exists cut-preserving sketches. So you can actually show that you can, for any connectivity value and any terminal set, you can get a graph whose size is roughly poly t, c squared. 
for all pairs max flow, that's the other one. This, in fact, this is actually a very early result by Gomery and Hu. What they showed is that for any graph, I can take, uh, I can take, and I can build a tree such that the mean cut on the tree is equal to the mean cut for st pairs. And this is something that can also be shrunk, just the same way you can shrink a tree. So that actually, for things like flows cuts, there actually are a lot of these positive results. Except the problem here is that there's a bottleneck of construction time. We don't know how long it takes to construct these. And in fact, any type of result that's able to construct these in subquadratic time can likely be adapted to give better data structures. And, and as, also, as res, this result is motivated a little bit by spectral algorithms, there are also quite a few questions in the spectral space, which I think is also amenable to this type of approach. The, the first is squared resistance. Squared resistance, instead of computing resistance with respect to the quadratic form, I can look at resistance with respect to the square of the quadratic form. So sure complement negative 2. What happens if I take negative 2 sec second power? This is something that there also are very good static algorithms for. So that it means that they're like, likely are fairly good dynamic ones. Recently, there has also been some work on elimination-based stru structural graph theory by Rao Schild and Srivastava. But that, that is actually its own high art. So uh, I also, if you're interested in that, I urge you, I suggest you look at the references there as well. But in fact, you can actually take a lot of these elimination random walk projection ideas and design very good. Uh, you can actually do some stru stru structural graph theory on top of that as well. OK, so and before I finish, I will take this to a slightly more abstruse level. In that I should make this, I would like to make this claim that this entire study of vertex sparsifiers, it actually best corresponds to the offline model of data structures. So the model, so that there's this general issue is that data structures by themselves, they are very strict requirements. You have to handle every query after every update. But in general, you, uh, for a lot of this vertex sparsification type of question, the existence of vertex sparsifiers is actually best studied in the case where you you're, no, you're given all the updates. So there's a different model for data structures, which is offline data structures, where you're given the entire sequence of updates. And you can pick, and the, what that gains you is that it gives you the ability to pick your terminal set of vertices based on the operations. In fact, if you look at the, the, the study of short complements, a lot of them were studied in settings where you, a lot of the earlier work in the space, so this includes results by Gramos, uh, uh, so Goranchi, uh, Hensinger, and Thorup, um, uh, studying dynamic resistance on uh, planar graphs. And on our end, uh, so this is a result by Durfee, uh, Peebles, King, Sashdeva. Uh, and uh, oh, oh, and Anu uh, they 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 use this type of idea to first study dynamic resistance for building random spanning trees, and also a lot of this has direct connections with sketching, which is also another kind of version of this. And I think it's even it's kind of more based on just communication. How much does it take for me to communicate? How much information do I need to communicate to you? Just the cut structure of a, on a subset of terminals. In fact, that's where the Asadi AL result was. Uh, that's how the Asadi AL result was was described at, as. So I think, in general, for this kind of vertex sparsification based structure, it actually helps at, at a first cut to uh, relax the definition of a data structure and study a little bit of this less study these less stringent requirements on data structures first. But, but going back to the more concrete open questions, uh, I think the first one is, I don't think any of our runtimes are correct. Uh, 0 0.75, 0 0.83, and 0 0.93. These, none of these should be the right answers. It's very likely one can get very much faster and also much simpler constructions for a lot of things we did, especially on the weighted graph case and also on the linear system solving side. We use a lot of randomness in this whole data structure. It would be nice to get a dynamic sparsifier that works against adaptive adversaries. So these are adversaries that can make queries dependent, can make updates and queries dependent on the previous updates and queries. 
So, so, uh, so in some sense, our data structure is still not in the strongest notion of data structures. So it'd be nice to get a worst case, uh, a worst case or even de-randomized version of our result. And finally, I think the kind of the, the question that, the one of kind of the, uh, the, the bigger questions in the space is, can you get vertex sparsifiers that work for C connectivity? So instead of just working with spectral algorithms, is it possible to address some of these longer open standing, the, lo the longer standing open questions in dynamic graph algorithms? In particular, in dynamic graph algorithms, there has, has been a lot of papers on two, three, and four connectivity. But once you say you're above 10, so once you take C above 10, there's actually surprisingly little that's known about them. Can we use this to address, say, dynamic 20 connectivity or ideally dynamic C connectivity in poly C time per update? And I think that's some of the, mo the most exciting questions in the space. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, we have time for questions now, if everyone, anyone has questions. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Sorry, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, OK. Uh, so this idea of uh, picking a set of terminals that kind of preserve some properties, is there anything similar to this known for um, distances, like single source shortest path kind of distances? I mean, I, I know there are spanners for you know making uh, number of edges smaller, but number of vertices in some sense. Oh, so what happens with shortest path? So shortest path, the picture is kind of reversed in that shortest path, uh, there is very good elimination as well. Because all you do when you take a vertex, the way you eliminate a vertex is you just take all pairs of edges going into it and just replace by the shortest path between them. So what you do is for every vertex, you just take every pair of neighbors and you, you're putting a distance that is the sum of them. And then you say, is that less than the distance in my graph? And then you put that edge in. So for shortest path, there are very good vertex elimination schemes. But where this breaks down for shortest path is that we don't have very good sparsifiers. So the issue actually is precisely what you're saying about spanners. In that for, for distances on graphs, we don't have very good schemes for taking a dense graph and uh, uh, just turning into a sparse one while preserving distances exactly. Spanners lose you a factor of log n. And to my understanding, the hardest, so, so, so for, for some of these distance-based questions, there are actually complexity theoretic uh, implications. I think for diameter, there is like ETH type implications if you're able to get a better di diameter algorithm. And my general impression there is a lot of these hard instances are actually on dense graphs. So these implications, if, if you're even approximating up to one plus epsilon, this kind of complexity theoretic yeah, I think the hardness results are that if you get to 1.5 minus epsilon, oh, okay, you're, like you're beating, like you're 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 able to improve a strong exponential time hypothesis. Let's see. And the Let's reason see. is 1.5 is actually that the the hard instances are about two versus three. So distinguishing between a diameter two and a diameter three case. And the the hard example is actually just a complete graph. In that mm -hmm. for a complete graph, right, the diameter is one. I think you can prove that any sparse graph, the diameter is roughly somewhere in like the log n regime, just by like an expansion type argument. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, I had one question about how you pick terminals. Mm -hmm. Right, you pick it uh, uniformly at random, right? Wouldn't it be? somewhat of a better idea to pick high degree vertices as terminals? Oh, so so the, it's uniform random at the end point of edges. Right. So if it's so for a high degree vertex, the, the high degree vertices are more likely to pick just by having more edges. I see, I see. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I had one question. I had one question. You mentioned uh, that your uh, bounds you consider to not be the right answers. Uh, do we have any non-trivial lower bounds for the type of problem you studied? 
So for exact resistance, there are some uh, lower bounds. Uh, I think there, if for exact resistance, all pair exact resistance, I think there is one that's based on triangles. Uh, this is, uh, I think this is, I don't know the exact reference off the top of my head, but uh, I think the, the Muscles as well as Sidford was involved in this. I'm, I'm not sure how much that narrows things down, but <laughs> Uh, there, there are some hardness that says that if you're able to compute effective resistance exactly for all pairs of vertices, you're able to, to be triangle counting. But for this kind of approximate resistance, uh, I'm not aware of lower bounds. I actually conjecture that the right answer is polylog. Mm, wow, okay. And the reason, the, the, the part of the reason that, uh, the part of the reason I think polylog is the right answer is that uh, the, there is, I mean, the sparsifiers are highly sampled objects. So the, the usually the right way to go about doing one of these is actually have multiple layers of sparsifiers and then propagate updates from one layer to the next layer and then to the next layer so that the, each layer, the decrease factor is not very big. What we had trouble doing is uh, saying that no matter how many updates happen to my sparsifier, the amount of updates in the sparsified graph is small. This is actually this type of argument. So if you look into the, the edge sparsifier, the dynamic edge sparsification paper, what it's built upon, it's actually built upon dynamic spanners. So it's actually based, so the dynamic edge sparsifier is actually built upon log n layers of dynamic spanners. And there, there actually is a, like that result actually crucially relies on if you update a spanner, no matter how many times you delete from a spanner, the amount of things that come out is roughly n log n. So that actually corresponds to the number of vertices. So all this result is really missing from getting to a, to a, getting to a polylog per update type of result is that you need the analog of a, uh, you need the analog of like the result that's proven for spanners for sparsification. And this is well, this is kind of one way to unblack box things that we didn't look very carefully at because we're really more concerned with can we just get a sublinear update time? I see. Okay, that's cool. Thanks. Anyone else with questions? All right, I'm gonna take us offline in a second. Anyone who wants to hang around and ask Richard more questions is welcome to stay. Uh, let me just mention that again, two weeks from now, we're gonna have uh, Tasha Fol Saranac from TTIC. And two weeks after that, we're gonna have Chris Pikert uh, from Michigan. All right, thank you very much.